Good afternoon, everyone, and I would like to welcome you to this week's ECHO session. And uh, today we will be discussing the management of drug resistance, tuberculosis, drug side effects. And uh, to discuss this uh, presentation today is Dr. Waluvita from, from uh, Western Province. I welcome everyone in the network, and please feel free to participate. And definitely, we'll go as we did last week and the week previously in breakaway sessions when it comes to discussing the case of the day. I would also like to <clears throat> remind people in the network that please kindly ensure that you mute your devices and name them so that we are able to identify you. Today, uh, with me, of course, we've got the usual HNP uh, students from UTH. And uh, Dr. Lubita, please kindly go ahead and introduce yourself. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm Lisulo Walubita, is introduced by Dr. Mpeta. I work in Western Province as a clinical care specialist, but I'm a consultant physician. And uh, today we will go through uh, the management of uh, DRTB side effects. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. 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 so welcome to this session. The learning objectives would be at the end of this session that we are all going to be clear and be able to pick the different side effects, what to do, and how to manage these conditions. This is a follow-up on the previous uh, presentation last week. So it's a continuation of last week's presentation. Uh, and obviously, I'll skip certain things, assuming we can link to last week's presentation uh, by Dr. Patrick Ilungu, the NTP manager. Maybe as, as we discuss the learning objectives, um, we can actually have a, a recap of what we discussed last week, so that for those who missed, they can have a chance to, you know, pick up. So this is Mark Pope, can you go ahead with last week's recap? So last week's echo session was on multi-drug resistance uh, tuberculosis, with emphasis on risk factors and diagnosis of, mul of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. It was uh, said that multi-drug resistant TB, TB was defined as a form of tuberculosis <coughs> caused by mycobacterium TB strain that have acquired resistance to one or more anti-TB <coughs> drugs. It was also mentioned that drug-resistant TB uh, being classified as uh, treatment history or drug-resistant pattern. We also discussed the high-risk groups for drug-resistant TB, which included being in close contact with patients, being with patients having drug-resistant TB. TB. We discussed factors contributing to development of drug resistant TB, which is healthcare provider related, such as poor management of adverse reactions, ETC, also drug related, such as non availability of drugs, also patient related, such as poor adherence. We also discussed the diagnosis of mild uh, drug resistant tuberculosis. It was emphasized that adequate management of susceptible T TB is cardinal in preventing drug resistant tuberculosis, and that every TB patient should have drug susceptibility testing done. It was also mentioned that patients with discordant recurrent results should be treated as drug-resistant 
TBK. It was also revealed that contact tracing and monthly monitoring is cardinal in management of drug resistant tuberculosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Makuke, for that recap. And I think uh, to a little bit I can pick up uh, from, from last week's. That's Thank you, Dr. Beta. Thank you, Mrs. Makuke. So I will skip certain things, but I need us to reflect on this slide as a recap of the different medications that were discussed by the team last week that are used in the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis, uh, drugs from group A, group B, group C. And the principles that we discussed as of last week that you picked two or three uh, of the medications in group A, add one or both, depending on which one you picked from group A, and any additions that we put from group B. So that's how we constitute, or uh, that's how the short arrangements, the standardized short regimen, the standardized long regimen is designed as our NTP program. So those drugs are used, not all of them in one patient, but different combinations for, to meet different uh, needs. As you know, the treatment for DRTB is patient-centered and may change depending on the situation. So because of the number of drugs uh, that these patients with uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis take, they'll prevent, it's an advent that they'll present with different side effects because of the, 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 the the high numbers of different drugs that have to be combined. But of note, the majority of the side, of the side effects are not that severe and can be managed without suspending therapy. And this is hinged on good communication between the patient, the health worker, and the NTP program. Next. Now, side effects can, in DRTD side effects as in other conditions, can increase mortality or predispose to permanent disability or morbidity in a patient. Uh, because of these problems, patients may poorly adhere to treatment. And if they do so in DRTB, you can worsen the resistance. And what happens is sometimes when healthcare workers try to modify the regimens to address the side effects, they may end up weakening the regimens and having a low efficacy regimen for treatment of these patients. So these are issues that you need to take care of when des designing a regimen for a patient, when putting a patient on DRTB medications. There are risk factors that are associated with uh, an increased uh, rates of uh, side effects. Top on the list is patients with DRTB and have HIV disease have high chances of developing side effects. More so because they have to take a number of drugs one for ART, two, three, four, five, six drugs for DRTB, and maybe you put on three, four other drugs. So the number of tablets they have to take and the drug to drug interactions become more. Uh, malnutrition, alcohol, anemia are some of the high risk factors. So when you have a patient presenting with malnutrition, disseminated TB, and they have history of abusing alcohol, they are anemic, they have HIV infection, they're more likely to develop side effects or adverse effects, purely because of the, uh, the disease 
progression and the number of tablets they have to take. Other comorbid conditions like diabetes mellitus, chronic renal failure, do predispose to uh, high rates of side effects. As mentioned earlier, there are many side effects in MDR-TB. Some of them may require that we stop the drugs altogether or we replace one drug with another. In some other cases, we may have to stop the treatment altogether. But of note also is a large proportion of our patients with MDR-TB may default. And this usually is related to the adverse reactions or they are taking a, a large number of tablets and usually the treatment is of longer durations. So when we are designing regimens for these patients, we should make sure because of the above reasons that we take the issue of drug to drug interactions, adverse effects into account and principally put the patient in the middle of the decision that we make. 50% of patients on DRTB treatment will report one or two side effects. But usually with good management, only about 5% or so would need, uh, will have to stop the treatment. Okay, thank you very much. And we will go into our first poll question. So it's in form of a clinical scenario and we shall um, request that everyone participates. So the first uh, question is, Mr. TK is a 49 year old man who has started on standardized drug resistant TB regimen. One month later, he complains of having developed rash on his arms and face. He gives history of heavy alcohol intake prior to starting ATT. He stopped the alcohol upon starting ATT. How would you manage this patient? A, continue same regimen without interventions after patient reassurance. B, continue, continue treatment, offer nutritional counseling, and increase the dose of vitamin B6 and closely monitor. C, record this reaction as an adverse reaction and refer him to a specialist hospital. So we can give it a go ahead. We can give it a go on the poll which is on your screens. Okay, thank you very much. That was the first poll question. We'll go to the second poll question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Mr. TK returns two weeks later for a review. His body rush has improved greatly but you notice that he's struggling to hear you throughout the interaction and complains of vomiting twice the previous night. His creatinine dine upon arrival was 350 micro moles per liter. Is otherwise normal and physical examination and the rest of the labs are normal. How are you going to classify the side effects? Is it mild, moderate, severe or life-threatening? 
I can see a number of polls, surprisingly only 20, so we can increase that study to 50%. Okay, thank you very much. We shall have our third poll question. All right, following the same story of uh, Mr. Tike, it says, what would you do to the offending drug? So what would you do to the offending drug? A, if the offending drug is critical to the regimen, reduce the dosage and timing and continue. If not critical, then replace it with another drug without compromising the potency of the regimen. B, stop all ATT until side effects have resolved. So what would you do to the offending drug in this patient, which is Mr. TK. If the offending drug is critical to the regimen, reduce the dosage and timing and continue. If not critical, then replace it with another drug without compromising the potency of the regimen. And then B, stop OATT until all the side effects are resolved, then restart OATT. Okay, so we seem to be going for everything. We'll definitely come back to the poll questions. So Dr. Alvita, we can continue. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mpeta, for the poll questions. So the, the side effects in DRTB is in other drugs are usually classified into four mild ones are those that do not interfere significantly with the lifestyle of the patient. Moderate, uh, they produce some impairment, uh, but the patient is functioning very well and okay uh, and uh, not hazardous to the health of the patient. Severe ones, they produce a significant impairment or incapacitation of functioning in a patient life-threatening, the adverse event causes extreme impairment of functioning, requiring hospitalization, and if left untreated, can either lead to death or permanent impairment. So what are the principles uh, of side effects in managing these patients. We should know that second line drugs, in as much as they are not as effective as the first line drugs in treatment of TB, they have more side effects. So pre-treatment education of patients, counseling and consent regarding certain potential side effects is very crucial in designing regimens for DRTB. Timely and aggressive interventions to manage these side effects is of critical importance. And look out because some patients may tend to be timid and they may not, they may not report all the side effects. So as a healthcare worker, you should be able to look out because one side effect may overshadow the other. So they may not report all the side effects, but just report one or two. Uh, but we should help these patients because they are taking quite a number of drugs. So for minor and moderate side effects, uh, we usually go for symptomatic treatment. 
um, based on the recommended or off the shelf drugs, usually the patients will be able to take their ATT, be able to take the medications at home. For moderately severe side effects, we may have to reduce the dosage or frequency of the suspected a drug. Uh, dosage would be if you are giving 500, you can bring it to 250 to go to the minimum uh, dosage. And if you are giving it every day, if it's admissible, reduction in frequency would mean you giving it maybe three times with a weekend free. Uh, because this is, this is so because some side effects are dose dependent. And in some cases, we may have to do a sequential drug challenge in order to overcome this. But by all means, try and keep to an adequate dose according to the body weight of the patient and the renal function of the kidneys. But be mindful of the fact that because most of these drugs have a very narrow uh, therapeutic index, when you are adjusting the dosages, you, you have to be very careful so that you do not um, uh, make less concentrations of the drugs. For major side effects, usually uh, what we do is, in certain cases, you may have to stop the medications completely or you remove uh, the offending drug, and then subsequently reconstitute another regimen for the patient if they are unable to tolerate those drugs. Patients are hospitalized and managed within the hospital. Uh, if the offending drug or reduction in the dosage does not help to resolve the side effects, you can stop it all together without compromising the efficacy of the regimen and replace it with one or two more drugs. And this is usually the last resort. You try to manage to stick to the regimen. The changing of the regimen is the last resort where you can't um, do anything. If need be, you have to do a drug challenge which should be done after careful consideration in every situation. Next. So we will go through the, the major side effects that we tend to have uh, when we are treating patients and that we should all be on the lookout for. One, hypersensitivity reactions. When you have a hypersensitivity reaction in any situation, you should suspend all the medications, admit the patient, and commonly among these is SJS, or toxic epidemonecrolysis, or Steven Johnson syndrome. It's very common, the whole skin all over the body may peel off. You need to identify the causative agent or the drug that is causing that, and wait until the patient has completely the lesions have healed, put the patient on a steroid, cover on other antibiotics, hydrate the patient, make sure pre uh, infection is prevented until there are no more new lesions. Then you start the ATT doing a drug challenge. And how do we go about it? You have identified the cause. You introduce the drugs, drug by drug, starting with the least likely drug to cause the reaction. And if there is no reaction, we start with a minimal dosage. If there is no reaction after the drug is introduced, you wait for three to six days, depending on the situation, and scale up to the full dosage. And again, you start with the other drug. So this is the process that we follow until you get to the drug that is the offending drug. And if the reactions reoccur when the offending drug is reintroduced, then you withdraw it completely and replace it with another drug. Severe hepatitis, quite common 
in Diara TB and the drug sensitive TB. Usually the patients may present, present with nausea, vomiting and fever and abdominal pain, sometimes with anorexia. Jaundice is not, may not be there, but once the patient presents with nausea, vomiting, fever, abdominal pains, anorexia, maybe with an enlarged liver, be suspicious of the patient having acute hepatitis. Quickly do your liver function tests. Uh, they, these are symptoms that may occur before even jaundice or passing, passing of dark urine occurs. Usually in uh, drug susceptible TB, you suspect PZ, DNH, rifampicin. Uh, once you have warnings of hepatic toxicity, you stop the TB treatment and reintroduce when the LT is um, below two units. Um, if it's above five, that's the limit that you, you, you use to stop. You, rem you recall that in DRTB treatment, we still use uh, some of the first-line drugs. Ethambutol is one of them. High-dose INH is one of them. Pyrazinamide is one of them. So we need to identify, as usual, the causative agent. And if necessary, you can pull it out if without compromising the regimen, if the jaundice or the hepatitis continues. If it resolves and on reintroduction, it does not recur, you can continue with uh, the drug until the end. Usually when you have hepatitis, the, 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 the treatment is supportive. Renal failure, mainly due to aminoglycosides that we use, less more so with the polypeptides. Uh, usually you can reduce, if you are able not to replace the aminoglycoside or the polypeptide, you can reduce the dosage to the minimum accepted and reduce the frequency. If the renal function continues deteriorating, you discontinue uh, the drug and you monitor the renal functions and adjust the dose accordingly. If not, if because this is part of the reason why canamycin is being, it's an aminoglycoside, is being taken out of the regimen, as we had discussed last week with Dr. Patrick Lungu, most of our patients are coming down with renal failure and autotoxicity. So if you can't, um, you do not have any other options, you can replace it with capromycin. If you don't have capromycin, then you can stop it all together and use other alternatives. Peripheral neuropathy is a very common side effect. The offending drugs are streptomycin, canamycin, amicacin, capromycin, INH, Tridazone, cycloserine, ethionamide, or fluxaslin, moxfluxaslin. You can see up to ethambutol. It's the whole list of all the drugs that you that we use in DRTB. So it will be a common side effect that you'll be seeing in most patients. The, the best of it is most of the patients, once they stop the treatment, they may not need uh, treatment for peripheral neuropathy. Um, for those who have problems with peripheral neuropathy where it incapacitates them, we can use unsubstance C agents, the tricyclic antidepressant drugs, and we can use physio to help them. Usually, once they stop treatment, only less than 10% may need follow-up. Of note, are patients with comorbid conditions like uh, diabetes, if they have HIV and uh, there is history of heavy alcohol, the tendency to have peripheral neuropathy is very high. It's usually not reversible, but once the treatment ends, 
usually it resolves on its own. It goes and with very few, less than 10% will need uh, to be followed up with medications afterwards. Yes. Psychosis or psychotic side effects are quite common. Cycloserine, ethionamide, isoniazid, or floxacillin. Uh, the quinolones are, uh, are culprits for this. They cause uh, psychotic symptoms. Usually when the patient has this, you hold the treatment for one to two weeks, while at least you give drugs uh, to control the psychosis. And then you can... Uh, replace the drugs, but if you notice that maybe one or two, if you put, uh, for example, cycloserine, the person becomes more psychotic, then you have to re retrieve it all together and replace it with another uh, drug. Uh, and we should be careful that if patients are on ART, a combination of these drugs with uh, efavirenz, nefirapine, may give um, high risks to, the, to these patients developing psychotic symptoms. However, of note is the point that prior history of psychiatric disease is not an absolute uh, contraindication to starting these patients uh, on, uh, on DRTB treatment. We still can manage, even when they have history of psychiatric disease, you still can manage them even on these medications. Hypothyroidism, very common. Uh, if we are using ethionamide or paramine or salicylic acid, and with hypothyroidism, uh, usually you do TSH if it's above 10, it's diagnostic and replace it with thyroxine. And once the medications are stopped, patients are able to pick up without the need for replacement therapy. Uh, associated with uh, hypothyroidism is depression. Uh, depression comes along with suicidal tendencies. And these are the drugs as listed in the earlier on that um, make the patients be more likely to present with depression. Also, you should take note that these are patients that would have been very ill for a long time their socioeconomic status may, and in most cases in our scenario, would have deteriorated. So they may be depressed because they can't earn a living for, for, for themselves, for their families, and they need help. Usually, a prior history of depression is not a contraindication. You still can start their patients on these medications, but you need in that scenario, you need to take this into account and make sure you assess their homes socially. Uh, currently in the program, we, we, we do give them stipends for food um, and stipends for transport refund because the treatment is long. So if their socioeconomic status is very important when you are making a decision to start them on medications. Otherwise, they will default. Huge number of tablets, you can't take them without taking food. Yes. Um, of note uh, is a QT prolongation. Um, I hope you are able to see the QRIS complex uh, on the slides. I hope it's a little bit hazy, but I'm sure you are able to see it. This is to remind all of us of the, uh, what the QT um, interval is. I won't go into the yes. intrinsic calculation of the QT interval, but what we need to know is uh, there, is, there are different values be, between men and women. Generally, we take it at 450 or less for women uh, or men 430 or less. This is normal. Borderline is between 431 to 450, 
51 to me. But if for, we, for men it's above 450 and for women it's above 470, then we say uh, the QT is prolonged. This is, you find this, re, this side effect more with bedaclin, uh, delanamid, uh, moxfloxacillin, clofazmin, and levofloxacillin. This leads to, if there is prolongation of QT interval, um, it leads to arrhythmias, and the person can die uh, because of irregular heartbeats. It depends for BDQ and DLM, you, you have to monitor them uh, more closely in the first few months, the first one week, second week, uh, third week, to about a month afterwards, you need to do ECGs. Meaning, all the patients that are on these drugs, they should have at least an ECG done. And if their QT is below 450 and the electrolytes are normal, you usually continue with the, uh, with the, with the drugs. You can, um, if the patient was on clofazmin, um, you can stop it altogether. If they are on moxfloxacillin, you can stop the moxfloxacillin and replace it with liver because moxie has high chances of causing QT uh, prolongation than liver. So in summary, these are the drugs that you need to suspect when you have side effects, when you are treating a patient with drug-resistant tuberculosis. For hepatitis, it's pyrazinamide, dicenazid, ethionamide, pass, or floxacillin, moxfloxacillin, levo, renal failure, it's the canamycin, amicacin, capremycin, uh, Arthralgias, which um, it's PZ, or floxacillin, moxfloxacillin, levo, gastritis, mild or severe is pass, ethionamide, DNH, clofazmin, and pyrazinamide. And the rest is outlined through up to seizures where we have isoniazid or floxacillin, cyclosterin, moxfloxacillin, and levo. So you notice that most of the side effects, the drugs are crossing over from one side effect to the other. And these drugs, they are going to take them for a long period of time. They are going to take many drugs, more than five at a go. And if they tend to have HIV, they will be added on with the ARRT. So they need, patients need a lot of counseling, a lot of uh, encouragement, a lot of support for them to be able to pass through this. So with coordination, good communication, a lot of support from the healthcare workers, they are able to pull through the treatment without uh, much trouble and be able to finish their course and be cured. So thank you very much. That's the... That's the end of the... The session on the side effects, it's long. It's a long, complicated, windy topic that uh, we, can't, we may not be able to exhaust uh, in uh, an hour. It usually takes a lot of days for us to go through this, this session. So we can get back to our polling questions and discuss them. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's revisit the first poll question. So the first poll question was about Mr. TK, a 49-year-old. Okay. All right, so Mr. TK is a 49-year-old who was started on standardized drug-resistant treatment, uh, TB regimen, and then one month later, he complains of having developed a rash on his arms and face. He gives a history of heavy alcohol intake prior to starting ATT. He stopped alcohol upon starting ATT. The question was, how do you manage this patient? 
A, continue the same regimen without any interventions after patient reassurance. B, continue treatment, offer nutritional counseling, increase the dose of vitamin B6 and closely monitor patient. C, record this reaction as an adverse reaction and refer him to a specialist hospital. Mm, only 10 out of uh, 100 have voted. Can we give it an attempt? There was, uh, I think, uh, a facility which was asking if we could rerun the poll question. I think you have a chance now. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Waluvita. The majority, about 77, have gone for B. For what B. do we make out of this? I go with, uh, with the majority. That's the most correct. This is a patient who, first of all, the risk factors um, are one alcohol. He was taking heavy alcohol and only stopped when he started um, taking ATT and he was put on a standardized uh, DRTB regimen which we know contains high dose uh, isoniazid as part of the regimen as discussed last week. So most likely this patient with history of um, high dose isoniazid, heavy alcohol intake, upon starting ATT, he develops rash on both the feet the arms, I mean, on both the arms and the face, most likely this is a photosensitive dermatosis, which may likely be pellagra, either drug potentiated or drug induced because of the, the previous alcohol intake and the INH the patient is. So, mild to moderate reaction, you reassure the patient. And this, once you do this to these, uh, these actions to the patient, they will quickly resolve. Within a week to two weeks, you'll be amazed at how quickly the, the, the lesions will go. Okay, so we now go to the second poll question. We we'll revise it. So the second poll question is, Mr. TK returned two weeks later for a review. Is body rash had improved greatly, but he noticed he was struggling to hear throughout the interaction. He complains of vomiting twice the previous night. His creatinine upon arrival was 350 micromoles per liter. He's otherwise normal and physical examination and the rest of the lab tests were normal. So the poor question is, how would you classify this drug side effects. We can give it a go. How would you classify this side effects? A, mild, B, moderate, C, severe and life-threatening. So remember, the rash has improved, but he now can't hear you, and he had been vomiting, and the creatinine uh, Creatinine, um, um, serum creatinine was 350 micromoles per liter. So what is the class of this drug side effects?
Okay, Dr. Walwita, this is uh, how they okay. voted. Again, the majority going for B, the ma and uh, yeah, C, then A. Thank you, Dr. Mpeta. However, the majority are not always the winning team. Remember when what we said on severe reactions, there are reactions that permanently uh, damage the functionality of a patient, or they can, if not treated or attended to adequately, they can lead to, 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 to death. So this patient, if you recall in our the longer regimen that we are using now, we are still dependent on uh, the amino glycosides, which are injectable, which is canamycin. We still have patients that are taking that and capriomycin. That, uh, so this is a patient who had pellagra at the beginning. Now they, they are struggling uh, to, to, to hear you during consultations, most likely. They are, they are having vestibular and autotoxicity. And this, with the amino glycosides, this is permanent. It's, an irre it's irreversible. Once a patient is, uh, has autotoxicity, their, their, their hearing is impaired for life. However, the renal failure is reversible. Uh, the creatinine is high. If you withdraw and treat this patient, uh, adequately you, you reduce the dosage or if not you completely stop the injectables and replace either with bedaculin or, or delanamide is without compromising the, uh, the the efficacy of the regimen you still can treat this patient and the, their kidneys can recover fully so this is a severe life-threatening reaction. Though the patient is still sitting before you, talking to you, complaining of mild vomiting the previous day, their creatinine is, is already high and their hearing is already gone. And as a clinician, if you do not pay attention, because you are still seeing this patient sitting before you, chatting before you, don't think those side effects are mild. They are already life-threatening and the condition of this patient can change at any time. And this is a common scenario that we find in the facilities, in the chest clinics when we treat these patients. They would already have shown you that they're having problems. So you need to quickly act, even if they are still uh, looking okay, they, are already on the, they already have danger signs. So the last poll question, I think it's the same, Mr. TK will return two weeks uh, later. The rash had improved, and then you notice that he's having struggling with hearing, and the creatinine was about 350, and he had been um, vomiting. So, what would you do to the offending drug? I know that Dr. Alvita has been explaining and uh, probably has answered uh, this question already, but we can still give it a go. So what would you do to the offending drug? A, if the offending drug is critical to the regimen, reduce the dosage and timing and continue. If not critical, then replace it with another drug without compromising the potency. Then B, stop ATT until all side effects are resolved and then restart. In this case, we okay. we go okay. for they're A. Still okay. They're still voting. Okay, oh. we can go ahead. Yeah, I go with the majority. In this case, what we need to do because of autotoxicity and renal failure, we reduce the dosage and frequency of the drug. And if it's not critical, we stop it all together and replace it. We continue with the medications, replace it as explained earlier with one or two drugs. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, now we have to definitely, unfortunately, some of the questions will come and address them when we come and uh, discuss in the plenary the case. Because of time, I would um, advise that we go straight into the case. Dr. Lusa and team, are you ready to share the case?
Dr. Lusa. Yes, we are, we are ready to share. Okay, please kindly go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sombo, although you are kind of breaking, yes? So two weeks ago, we discussed um, the side effects of dolutegravir, and I think we had an overwhelming response of where people said they have seen similar type of rashes uh, after patients being uh, transitioned to dolutegravir. Yes. So, put it, put it Dr. Lusa, you can do that quietly, yes. please. Can you do that quietly? Okay. No, I'm sure. Hello. Okay, we'll share it from here, Dr. Lusa. Is that okay with you? Dr. Lusa? Hello, Dr. Mpeta. It's okay. You can share from that side. All right, thank you very much. So stop stop sharing from your end, then we'll go ahead. Stop also sharing. Okay, and kind of mute yourself for now. I'll tell you when to unmute. Yes, so we discussed about the skin, the photosensitive drug reaction to Doltegrava, which has been observed in a number of centers after patients are switched to DTG-based uh, regimen. So we are trying to find out how many of us have seen this type of rashes or have experienced this type of rashes. So I will draw uh, uh, members in the network to the chat, especially after we are done, to click on the link that has been provided in the chat, okay? To take you to a Google form that will take about maybe two or three minutes for you to fill in so that you just tell us exactly if you have seen such rashes in your practice, and then we see what we can do about it. So it's a, it's a very easy form to fill in, and I would age that people do that immediately after we are done with this. So Dr. Lusa and Tim, please kindly go ahead. Good, mo good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. We are presenting a case uh, from Eastern Province, Chipata Central Hospital, precisely from uh, the chest clinic. And to present the case, I'm Dr. Lusa. Here we are presenting a case of uh, Mr. SM, 27 years old. He was newly diagnosed HIV positive and was started on ARIT in September 2016. <laughs> He was married with two children, was not employed, but at time could do bricklaying. There is history of alcohol and smoking. SM was first treated as TB cat one in September 2016. Monitoring of SM showed at two, three, and six months, that was March 2017, the micro micro microscopy smear, all the three were positive. And at that time, it was declared treatment failure. On 9th March 2017, it was started as category 2 TB, and monitoring this time showed at three months microscopy smear negative. But at six and eight months, the microscopy smear results were positive. 
and this was in December 2017, he was again declared treatment failure. On 28th December 2017, gene expert was done. The results were rifampicin non-resistant, and the sample sent for DST and culture, the results showed resistance to INH. He was therefore treated as MTR INH resistance. And the regimen was for FDC plus levofloxacin, and this was, been, was given for six months. Monitoring this time in 2017 at three months, the smell was still three, positive, three plus. At nine months, a gene expert was done. It revealed MTB detected and medium. So in 2017, again, SM was declared treatment failure. You can go. That was six. On 6 September 2018, because of the treatment failure, in consultation with experts, it was advised that SMB restarted on the same regimen which was uh, 4 FDC plus levofloxacin for six months and monitoring at two, three, and six months had revealed that the were negative, AFB were negative. He was declared this time cured. And this was uh, on 14th March, 2019. Seven months later, seven, uh, 7th October, 2019, SM came back to the chest clinic with complaint of cough, dyspnea, loss of weight for about a month. This time, gene expert was done, and uh, the results were rifampicin resistant. LPA was also done. It revealed INH and RIF resistance. GST was sent, but the results are still pending. On 11th October 2019, SM was uh, diagnosed as MDR, RIF, and INH resistance. And he was started on the presented regimen. Two weeks later, or on uh, 24th October 2019, Mr. SM had died. On the labs and clinical timeline, we only presented the lab regarding uh, the sputum examination since we did not have enough space to put the other labs. So here is the profile for gene expert and my microscopy smear as it was done on 6 September 2016. MTB detected for gene expert smear microscopy for all the three specimen when monitoring were all positive. March 2017, GeneXpert was done, MTB medium, and the smear microscopy negative for the first one, positive for the two others. December 2017, when he was declared as uh, resistant to INH on the first treatment, GeneXpert was done, MTB detected, medium INH resistance, but was sensitive to rifampicin, uh, and the smear was positive at two months, gene expert at nine months. In uh, 2018, on the second regimen, as uh, INH resistant regimen, gene expert was uh, MTB detected medium, smear positive, results were all negative for the three, and uh, it was declared cured. And uh, in uh, October 2019, the gene expert MTB detected and I, resistant uh, to ref rifampicin, DST, pending results, LPA, resistant to both INH, and rifampicin. This is when SM was being treated as MDRIS. Our questions What is the sensitivity and specificity of gene experts? What contributed to rifampicin resistance in these patients? 
or was it a missed opportunity for a refurbishing INHDR TB? And lastly, what is the gold standard for MDR diagnosis? These are our four questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, as we invite the, 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 the network to contribute, this is a 27 year old married with two kids, a bricklayer by, by, by occupation, who was diagnosed with HIV and TB in 2006, was studied on ART and TB treatment, on, which was um, drug sensitive TB. Then subsequent uh, smears at two months, three months, and six months were consistent positive. Dr. Lusa, kindly mute your. All right, thank you. So sputum follow-ups at two, three, and six months were persistently positive, and he was declared to have failed treatment uh, then. That was in March 2017. He was started on category two. And um, after two months, after three months, the sputum was negative, but converted again at six months and eight months, the smear uh, was still positive. He was declared again to have failed treatment, and now this was in 2017. Uh, December 2017, the expert was done, and they found that it was medium with rifampicin, with, with rifampicin sensitive, okay? So he was, uh, uh, DST was done, which came back isonazide resistance. He was commenced on four FTCs and levofloxacin for six months. Sputums at three and nine months were persistently positive on this regimen, and um, he was declared to have failed treatment once again. However, it was continued on the same regimen, which is 4-FTCs and levofloxacin, and then it was, it was declared cured in March this year. Um, seven months later, which was in October last month, this patient presented with constitutional symptoms, and then um, uh, expert was done, found that it had uh, resistance to rifampicin, and then LPA revealed resistance to isonazide and rifampicin, and he was started on MDR treatment regimen. Two weeks later, this patient unfortunately died. So Dr. Lusa and team, before we go to your questions, I will ask the network for any two clarifications. Yeah, but before we go into breakouts, we'll ask for clarifications, then we can go. So do we have any clarifications before we go into the specific discussion in the breakout sessions? Okay, so I cannot see any hand. So I will ask um, IT to please um, divide us or take us into the various breakout sessions where we we'll discuss this case at length. There's a question here from the IDC. A, all right, please go ahead. Doctor, I want to yes. find out those contracts, uh, the wife, the children, were they contacted? Contact tracing? Yeah. All right, Dr. Lusa, did we actually screen the wife and the two children to this patient? Yes, they were. Actually, the last one is a baby, but the other child and the mother have been screened negative. Okay, so they were screened and they were negative but for the smallest mm -hmm. child. Any other question before we go in breakout sessions? Okay, so let's see how we can actually dissect this case and discuss what has been raised uh, in, in, in this uh, case presentation. IT.
that this patient uh, uh, that we had. Okay, so before you answer others, let's give this folks a chance to actually see if they can, and then you comment. Now, the second question is that what contributed to rifampicin resistance in this patient? We have got five minutes. Senanga, HNP students, do we have any theories why this patient developed rifampicin resistance? HNP, we can't hear you, you're just talking among us yourselves. Yes, Katete, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, yes. yes. I think, yeah, my name is Gordon Mwase. Yeah, so the, I think there are a couple of possibilities why the patient felt. Maybe the first one is could be maybe there was issues of suboptimal, uh, that is in terms of intake of the drugs, uh, because the, the, the patient was, I mean, you, you, I mean, it was a patient that was alcohol uh, dependent. Yeah, maybe the other possibility could be uh, resistance to rifampicin. I mean, resistance uh, rifampicin maybe could have come in because of, uh, it came in as a new infection. Yeah, that is maybe from other sources. Yeah, maybe it was a primary resistance. So that's how this is. Maybe this is how maybe we can we can try to reason in those two lines. Okay, so thank you. If I got you correctly, you talked about adherence, which was a major issue leading to the selection of resistance strains then alcohol as well, which could be a risk factor. Now, I don't know in this context, was it a risk factor of acquiring drug resistance? Was it a risk factor to adherence or a risk factor for drug to drug interaction? I think maybe if you could just uh, clarify that. Hello? I think it's, I think it had to do with the adherence issues. Okay. Yeah, I think as it has been noted, because this is a client possibly that was supposed to be given drugs using dots, but this patient was taking drugs from home, and okay. maybe he continued right. taking alcohol. No, right. Yeah, that okay. could have caused maybe the suboptimal dosing, maybe also in line with the adherence. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got about a minute to wind up. I will ask just one contribution from, from the network. Any, any contribution, please go ahead. Uh, Dolly. Dolly, you can unmute and kindly contribute. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, Masongo Dress from Livingston. HNP. I wanted to talk about uh, the rifampicin resistance. I think it came about because if you look at this patient who's on alcohol, who's on treatment and also an alcoholic, it meant that uh, this person maybe was missing drugs. And if you look at drugs, as we are taking drugs, as long as there's that room of missing drugs, it brings about resistance. So even as much as we can treat this person, as long as they are missing drugs, adherence issues may come in, but that can bring resistance. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we've got about a minute, so we can summarize what we have discussed all together. So in terms of the first question, we've discussed about the sensitivity and specificity. I, I hope that people understand the difference between sensitivity and specificity. 
Is that so, or we could ask Dr. Alwita just to quickly tell us what the two mean. All right, so we spoke about sensitivity and specificity being very high for gene experts, and uh, that it ranges anything from 98% to 100% for sensitivity and 96 to 98% for specificity. And then contributions, of course, to rifampicin resistance is adherence, the patient continued being on alcohol, and then uh, issues of missing doses, and then uh, alcohol, drugs interaction could have actually also contributed to that. Then was it a missed opportunity for uh, rifampicin, INH drug resistance? Yes, I think from what uh, the discussion was from Dr. Alvita. And what is the gold standard of MDR diagnosis? And I think he's touched about this, and this is about culture. So I hope there are any clarification, or is there anything we have left so that we can return to the main session? Any contribution? We have got about 30 seconds to return to the main session. Sorry, any other negative results of monitoring the patient? We can't see any other investigation results apart from the x ray and the microscopy, like the NFT. Exactly. It, it would have been actually very interesting if we were trying to talk about what exactly could have cured this patient in terms of, you know, drug side effects. But that information was generally uh, lacking. We'll try to see how in the main session can be discussed. Okay, so ready to. All right, so thank you very much for those who have managed to get back to the main session. And uh, definitely we'll go back straight to discussing the case. And we are going to hear the uh, discussions that have uh, happened in the other room. So we'll start with Dr. Candio. Dr. Candio, what has been the discussions from your end? Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. We had an interesting discussion. And uh, we tried to tackle the four questions. So, uh, and um, from the discussion in um, our breakout room, uh, the first question, which talks about sensitivity and specificity of gene expert. So we uh, discussed that gene expert is actually more specific than sensitive. Uh, the sensitivity may range from 60 to 80%, but the spe uh, specificity, sorry, is somewhere around 90 to 92%. Then with regards to the second question, um, which talks about what contributed to rifampicin resistance in this patient. So one thing that was possibly considered is that uh, they could have been poor adherence to therapy initially. And we know that in most cases, that is the number one cause of who? Uh, HIV, whatever disease that you may be treating. So in this case, the group felt that it was possible that there was poor adherence and coupled with him being re-exposed to rifampicin. And obviously, may have been underdosing and all that, and eventually, this led to the development of rifampicin resistance. The third person, uh, which talked about, was it a missed opportunity for RIF INH GRTB? I think the group unanimously felt that it was, and the contributions were, first of all, clinically, um, when they did the first smear, the first time he was treated for drug sensitive TB, which was at two months, the group felt at that point, possibly a clinical decision could have been made to try and treat this patient as drug resistant TB, as well as send samples at that time for culture and DST. But also they had other views that, you know, thought maybe it could have been a bit then, but the fact that he was declared treatment failed at the end of the six months and then re-diagnosed with TB, uh, possibly at that point, we could have considered treating this gentleman for drug-resistant TB. But um, 
the comments from the group still felt like question two and three, you know, were linked. Like, even if we went ahead and did this, did we really fully address the issue of adherence? And regarding the gold standard for MDR uh, TB diagnosis, um, we did this, you know, as much as GeneX, but helps make an early diagnosis, but we know it only picks with one in resistance. The gold standard still remains the culture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kandio. Dr. Foloshi. Dr. Foloshi, SEOE. Yes, Kotel muted that. So anyway, essentially, it was around the same issues Dr. Nadio talked about. We had very good contributions from Chilenge, from, from Chaze. We thought that the sensitivity varies depending on if you are causing vascularly or if you are multiple. The sensitivity tends to be lower if you have very few bacilli, like in HIV. Um, it can even be as low as 70, 75%. As for people that have the rich bacilli, a lot of bacilli, it can even touch 85%. We agreed with uh, the other team that felt that the is higher because it, it seems there is consensus in the TV community that the specificity is quite high, 98%. When they say it's TV, it's very likely that it is. So it varies 96 to 98 percent. But of course, there are studies that have shown different things. We agree with Dr. Kandio's group. We felt this was a missed opportunity. The group felt that we could have appreciated more data on side effects, on adherence, on malabsorption, and any system issues that were present in this patient that could have led to this. We felt that this. However, there was another interesting school of thought from Chaza based on the lecture we had last week, which said that sometimes a result can come out gene expert, um, negative, brief, negative, and then eventually become positive. We do know that resistance is progressive, we agree with that. However, there's a possibility of variation in sampling site. So depending on where that sputum comes out from, it may be coming from <laughs> a site that has the same and, and drug resistant variant. So we wanted to acknowledge that TB can have mixed mixed phenotypes. You can have both coexisting. As for the culture, we ran out of time, but Macha says the gold standard is actually a, a culture. But we were even informed that we should expect some good tests. Of course, they won't reach the standard of culture such as the Ultras Ultra, Gene Express Ultra, that will have better sensitivity, better specificity. I believe the TV program is actually soon going to get Gene Express Ultra. I think that's it. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Foloshi. Equally in our session in our breakout room, we discuss almost the same, that the gold standard uh, for MDR diagnosis remains culture. And uh, of course, we also recognize that this was a missed opportunity. This patient probably we could have done couches earlier and then the diagnosis could have been made earlier. In terms of contribution to resistance, to pharmacy resistance, like everyone has said, it's poor adherence. And then we've been told that this patient continued actually drinking alcohol, of which uh, you know we know that it affects uh, compliance to medication and also alcohol drug interaction. Um, missed doses, of course, which is part of the adherence. And then there was a possibility that probably from the first exposure, he could have had the second exposure as a new infection. But we know that there is factors for primary uh, resistance uh, in terms of MDR in this patient who are not available. Uh, gene experts, uh, our group felt that it has got um, high sensitivity, of course, 98 to about 100 and specificity, which is also high, 96 to 98. But it was discussed that in patients who have got very few colon-forming units, it may actually tend to miss such, num uh, such kind of patients. And like Dr. Foloshi has said, 
such normally is seen in patients who are severely immunosuppressed, whose bacilli load is very low, and the gene expert also tends to perform poorly because there will be very few um, colon uh, forming units in such patients. So basically, this is what we discussed. Dr. Lusa and team, are there any clarifications that you would like to get from the recommendations that have been made by the groups? Of course, you will get a unified recommendation, but we just want to know if there are any aspects that have been addressed. Uh, I would like to say something uh, quick on the culture. I've uh, heard you talk about to say maybe we might have been delayed in sending the culture. Uh, I would like to confirm to say we've been sending these uh, samples in Osaka. I think uh, uh, of late some time back, there was a problem, I think, in CDL, of which they told us to say maybe that would have been the reason why the results were coming late. But uh, it is a it is a system that we have here that anyone that is not convinced, we always send the sample for DST. The another part, uh, I would like to hello. Yes, we I would can like get to you. Also, uh, yes, I would like to also contribute to say. Uh, we didn't just leave the issue just like that, despite the, the, uh, the demise of this uh, client. We are still uh, going ahead to, to, to check what caused that, despite this patient having, been, uh, having had the, been cured when uh, the patient was INH resistance. Uh, because even us, it was our worry that the, uh, the patient was not converting for some time. So uh, even after we discovered that the patient now has, uh, has full MDR, we, we still continue even up to now. We are still doing the contact tracing, and of which uh, before when Dr. Musa was mentioning about the history, he didn't just, she didn't just know that uh, as of now, as we are speaking, this uh, client was a twin. So the twin brother uh, was just started listening to, uh, uh, susceptible TB treatment uh, through uh, the nurses that we have. We have the nurses that are, are monitoring these patients. So it's only that uh, the patient was started on this treatment on the other uh, clinic, of which a uh, chest clinic didn't know about this development. So that okay, was just just. Just a question on the twin brother also having TB. Are they living in the yes. same house? They are living in the same house. Both mm -hmm. of them are married? Yes. They, uh, no, the, the other twin brother is staying with the parents, the one that is on susceptible TB. But this, so one, this were, other one was the one that was married. No. He's so not they were married. not staying together? They were not staying together, but uh, uh, through surveillance, We've discovered that uh, around that area, there are friends. There are some friends who have got uh, MDR TB right now. So right now, there is a lot of more like uh, the reinfection. It could be that this patient it was it was a reinfection, whereby he he got this uh, DR TB maybe from the friends because according to the histories, the friends they never they never disclosed to say. They are on MDR TB. So they usually link up maybe in drinking places. So that's what we discovered. So that, that's why we've just gone ahead to say we need to really intensify our, our contact tracing. All right. Thank you very much. And I think um, or the, the, through the National TB Program, we'll try to see how we can assist your facility in trying to identify these yes. hot spots. Yeah, uh, now just one last word from um, our expert for the day, Dr. Alvita. Uh, what can you make out? What, what could have made this person to die? Because we, we didn't address that. And we are talking about, you know, some serious drug effects. And, and what, what do you think we can theorize in this patient? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, for that uh, question. But 
maybe before I delve into that, there is something that comes out of the treatment of this patient. Uh, Non-adherence to guide guidelines by the NTP from the healthcare workers. I think that's one thing that comes out. Uh, we didn't adhere to the guidelines on how to treat drug susceptible TB in this patient fairly at two months, three months, six months, and we went ahead to uh, not to uh, start screening for DRTB. What exactly caused the death of the patient is will be a guess. We can hazard a guess this is an HIV positive patient with DRTB, uh, but I don't see the, the regimen that he was on ART, whether he was suppressed or not. But of note, he, is the, he has a lot of risk factors for side effects. He was taking alcohol heavily. He was HIV positive. We don't know whether he was uh, suppressed or not. He'd been sick since uh, September 2016, meaning most likely he must have had a he must have been malnourished and he was poorly adhering. So looking at the regimen that he was finally uh, given of bedaculine, linezolid, moxfloxacillin, and clofazmin, uh, and him dying within two weeks, one can speculate that most likely he could have passed on from, uh, from cardiac arrhythmias because Usually with this combination, you get QT prolongation within a period of one to two weeks without an ECG, without adjusting these uh, medications, most patients will drop, they'll die. Right. So most likely it could have been from that, but that's just a, I guess. a guess uh, right. Ooh, and a speculation. Been, yeah, yes. interesting if these things were done. All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank everyone who has participated in today's deliberations. And once more, before we actually break, I would like to remind that in the chat, there's a link to the Google Forms that we are expected. We, we are trying to follow up the cases of... Uh, 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 photo allergic reactions to dolutegravir in patients who have initiated or transitioned to, um, a, uh, to DTG based regimen. Kindly take some time to just take about two, three minutes to, to fill in and would we'll definitely encourage the mentors to, to lead this so that we can see what the scope of these skin reactions are to DTG. So you can actually copy the link before we close so that uh, you can post it in your web browser and then follow it up. We will definitely try to post the link through the WhatsApp group and see how we can share to as many people as possible. Next week, we will be discussing HIV self-testing. So please kindly submit any case that you may think will suit the topic of the day. From myself, Dr. Alwit, and everyone in the hub, uh, it's a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.